Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this Regaming Citicom video, we're going to be discussing and analysing tech news, which, as usual, has popped up over the past 24 or so hours. We're going to be starting things out with the Meltdown vulnerability, as told by Epic Games. That's right, the company have actually discussed what the impact is of the patches on their cloud services, and the numbers are actually pretty startling. Then we're going to move over to a deluge of leaked Coffee Lake S and... Ryzen 2000 motherboards. And then we'll move over to yet another piece of Intel news, although this is a more positive piece, because Intel are launching the 8th generation core processors, so we have much, much, much greater detail of the Radeon RX Vega combined with the Intel KB Lake cores. And then we'll finish the video with Nintendo Switch, specifically the fact that it is not only the fastest selling console in the United States, but also we have attachment rates on a variety of different games. So we're going to start things out, speaking of games, with Epic Games, which of course are the creators of the pretty popular Fortnite. Now, uh, this information comes to us from their forums, specifically the Fortnite forums. I'll, of course, place a link in the description of this video. And it's very interesting because they've provided a CPU performance uh, chart. Now, this, of course, is one of the back-end services, which naturally, because it's a you know online-based game, they need those to run and all. And you can see quite clearly a rather large spike in performance. For a, a moment there, it kind of tails off and then goes all the way up that green bar, and it's hitting around the 60% utilization. Beforehand, the peak looked around the 25%, 27%. So obviously, that's pretty damn in impactful. According to Epic Games, they are actually blaming recent login issues and server instability excuse me, on this patch and, of course, the fact that it is nuking performance. As a small um, aside, I've actually been speaking to a couple of server administrators and I'm also trying to get a couple of interviews with security researchers at the moment. Um, so I'm kind of leaving the majority of the Meltdown coverage off for the next couple of days because I want to discuss something that I've been working on for you know, the last you know, 24 or so hours. So we'll have to wait on that. But even so, you can see that, well, this is certainly not a negligible performance impact without any question. They are, however, still trying to tweak things and work on things to actually, of course, perform better. Speaking of perform better... Videocards.com have an interesting exclusive concerning ASRock, and specifically various Ryzen 2000 and Coffee Lake S motherboards. I'm not going to read all of these out because, well, some of them are just too numerous, but there is the ASRock Fatality series, which is the gaming K4, the professional gaming, and gaming ITX slash AC. There are, however, not particularly... Um, numerous details concerning what the specifications of those boards are. In other words, there are no specifications at all, so it's going to be interesting to see what the differences are. As we've already uh, discussed, primarily the 400 series uh, has a change in the PCIe. It's going from a 2.0 to 3.0, so obviously that means additional memory bandwidth. And of course, with the Ryzen 3 fresh, we're looking at a 12NM process. In regards to the Coffee Lake S motherboards, there are a plethora of those, and there are four chipsets in production, which is damn well numerous, to say the least. There's the H310, the B360, the H370, as well as the Q270, but apparently we also have a leaked list of the Z390 chipset, which contains the Pro 4, the ITX AC, and finally the Pro 4. Now, once again, the Z390 motherboards don't really have that many details um, in the wild. The only thing we have heard is that it might support 8-core Coffee Lake S chips, and I say might support because after the initial rumours popped out and a couple of others said, yeah, that sounds like that's going to happen from, another pe from other people in the industry, we haven't really heard anything since. So whether Intel will release 8-core Coffee Lakes is pretty much up in the air at this point. There is also another piece of exclusive news that videocars.com managed to snag, and this is in embargo until January the 7th, so essentially, you know, it's leaked a day or so early. And this, of course, is in regards to the 8th generation core processors with Radeon RX Vega graphics. Now, let's just be honest. If I said to you, like, 18 or 24 months ago, 
Intel and AMD are going to be collaborating and they're going to be putting together, you know, a joint APU. You might have thought to yourself, mm, don't know about that. You know, you thought, well, it makes sense in some ways, but you never thought it would really happen. Anyway, there are a lot of details. Of course, mainstream mobility, thick and light, uh, immersive and ent immersive entertainment, excuse me, long battery life, integrated Intel UHD graphics. Uh, this is with the ultra, uh, the mainstream mobility. However, the next two are what perhaps many of you are interested in, and that is thin and light performance with discrete graphics. Intel's high performance mobile enthusiast CPU, first consumer EMIB HPM2 discrete graphics on package, power sharing, enthusiast gaming and VR experience, innovative designs, highest performance Intel's highest performance mobile enthusiast CPU, CPU attached to discrete graphics for consumer, 4K gaming, professional media creation, and mega tasking. What you'll notice is there's very little dip, uh, announcing that they're actually working with AMD in those statements. The only things you do hear about is when we move to the next section. Now, this one, at this next section, actually has interesting details because finally we have confirmation that they have 4 gigabytes of high bandwidth memory too and a custom Radeon RX Vega M graphics. What also is confirmed, once again, is the fact that there is overclocking on the CPU, GPU, and HBM, and there are two performance power points. One is 65, and one is 100 watts. In fact, the hardware itself is absolutely tiny. It measures at just 1.7 mm in height. In regards to the performance, we have a few numbers. It has 4 gigabytes capacity, as I've just mentioned, 1024 bit with a bus width, though power usage obviously up to 24 compute units, asynchronous dispatch, per compute unit power gating, Vulkan and DirectX 12 ready, and supports for Radi Radeon showed Shade Intrinsics. Well, I really can't speak today. And of course, 16 render backends and 64 pixels per clock. According to these rumours anyway, some are predicting that the SKU, the highest performance SKU, should be faster than the GTX 1060 Max-Q. Obviously we're going to have to wait for independent verification of performance numbers. So anyway, it's a very exciting graphics chip indeed, and frankly I think it's going to be a very curious next couple of months. Obviously Nvidia do want those mobile sales, as you can imagine. So are we going to see some odd collaborations in the future? Are we going to see something crazy like, for example, Nvidia gobbling up fire so that Nvidia have the ability to produce x86 processors? That's what some people are saying could happen. After all, Nvidia technically do have an awful lot of cash. Well, as usual, watch this space. And anyway, we're going to finish this video with something a little more lighthearted, and that is that the Nintendo Switch is the fastest selling home console ever in the United States, and it has actually surpassed even the Wii. And this is according to Nintendo themselves, so this is not speculation or rumour. Now what I find very interesting is the fact that, yes, there are over... 4.8 million consoles sold, this is according once again to Nintendo's own internal estimates, but it's the actual volume of the games, the percentage of attachment rate for the games, which perhaps intrigues me more. So we'll start things out with the less uh, popular, and that is Splatoon 2 and Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. So Splatoon 2 has 20% of attachment rate, so 20% of Switch owners have bought, um, you know, uh, Splatoon 2. Half of the people who have owned a Switch have picked up Mario Kart Deluxe. It's 50%. But the numbers which really surprised me, first of all, Mario Odyssey, that has 60% of people in the United States have picked up Super Mario Odyssey. Now that, I can understand. Around 60% does make an awful lot of sense. I actually expected that perhaps to even be slightly higher, like around 62-63%. But Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is the one that perhaps surprised me the most. Supposedly over 55% own Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild for the Nintendo Switch. That actually shocked me. So there's a couple of reasons I can think of that the number isn't a little higher. The first is that obviously the game did also release on the Wii U. So for example, let's say that you've bought the Wii U version of Breath of the Wild. Yeah, okay, the Switch version is 
better, but are you going to be that, you know, that motivated to pick it up? Yeah, I'm not saying that the DLC is bad or, you know, the ability to play it with better graphics and all that stuff is not interesting, but still you might say, you know, I've already paid the money. I'd rather spend the money on a new game. I've already finished Breath of the Wild. I'll wait for it to go down in price. Um, instead, you know, I've just bought a Switch at Christmas or coming up to the holiday season. So there is always that possibility. And the other possibility is that the Switch at the moment is perhaps appealing to a different demographic. The demographics which weren't necessarily major Nintendo fans to begin with. Like, I imagine a lot of you perhaps grew up um, during the 16-bit wars when the Super Nin- when the Super NES or the SNES or the Super Nintendo, however you want to say it, was of course competing with the Genesis slash Mega Drive absolutely fiercely, especially in the US, of course, for a while the Genesis was ahead. And then in Europe, it was actually a really weird situation because over here, Sega were kind of ruling the roost with their advertising campaign. But after that, of course, many still really support Nintendo. But recently, with the fact that, of course, it is a mobile console, and the fact that uh, it still has an awful good, ca- awfully good, excuse me, good uh, good catalogue of games, plus, of course, it's now got the ability to play, say, Skyrim on the go, and, you know, Doom. Admittedly, of course, they're not as good as, let's say, the, the Xbox version, the PlayStation 4 version, but that's not the point. You can't really lug a Xbox One X onto the train with you. Let's just be blunt here. Um, you know, the airliner might frown on you if you start hooking up your PlayStation 4 somehow to their, you know, to their little piddly screen. So, of course, in that respect, the Switch certainly has its niche. And, you know, 55% attachment rate of Legend of Zelda is still pretty damn impressive. With all of that said, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.